Hello, Blood Bowlers. Welcome back to episode four. So we previously just got the pitch ready for the match. We just had the kickoff, our first kickoff of event, and uh, we're about to start flipping between the receiving team and the, the defensive team or the kicking team uh, turns. So before we get into what each player can do, I thought it was important to just kind of detail kind of like the general principles of, of the Blood Bowl game. And that includes uh, kind of you know, the turnover, um, the player actions, little things like that, and about how the game can swing, how the dice rolls can make huge differences and how the game ends up panning out. So uh, we'll quickly jump back into this again and uh, just quickly detail a few little things that I think it's worth knowing before we actually get into like the actions specifically. So we'll have a quick jump into this now. All right, Blood Bowlers. So uh, we're just going to have a look at the general principles now and um, how the game kind of all comes together. So we've just set up in the previous video the pitch and we've kind of gone over the dugouts. So we're just going to have a little look in more detail at the dugouts and then also actions in general before we move into, you know, what those actions actually look like on the pitch. So... Team turns, um, there's effectively 16 turns each. So the receiving team will do eight turns in the first half and the kicking team will do eight turns in the first half and then it will alternate in the second half. So the, the team that kicked the ball will receive the ball and the team that received the ball will effectively kick it and there'll be the defence. Now that, that relies, of course, on both teams either not scoring in their drive or... Uh, scoring at the very end of the drive um but even then there's still some time left on the clock you could call it for the the team that was defending to receive the ball so what i'm going to do i'm going to have a quick look at uh, a dugout explain kind of how a turn could kind of work or how like a half could kind of be structured together so i know brothers detailing a few other things so i've got a dugout here um we're going to sprinkle it with a few things so we've obviously got our re-rolls. I think that the Black Hawks had three re-rolls from uh, before. So I'm going to pop them here. There we go. Now we've got our turn marker. And we're going to have one for the score as well. So let's assume the Black Hawks are the receiving team. They're actually going to be moving their turn marker first. So they've received the ball from the kickoff, um, or if it was the other way around, the Elven Union team will be doing this. But the moment it's their turn, they have to move this here. Now, it does say in the, the rule book that you should try and keep track of this as much as possible. It's quite important. You don't want the game to suddenly go on forever because neither coach has really looked, kind of kept track of the game length. So it's a good idea for you to keep an eye on each other's turn markers. Um, and you just keep alternating effectively. One goes, the other page goes. So the Elven Union team have their turn and then the Blackhawks have their turn too. They might even spend a re-roll this turn and can remove that. Um, they might even have a turnover, which we'll get into in a moment. Um, but at some point during this drive, no matter how many turns, eventually, hopefully, the Blackhawk coach is going to score. So let's say the Blackhawk team scores on turn six. They will score when they actually move into the end zone. Whenever the ball is in possession of one of their players and moves into an end zone, the turn ends immediately and they score. So the Blackhawks have scored on turn six and uh, that means that now they get to move this marker to the one. They're one nil up against the Elves. Now, the, Elf, the Elven team will still be on, they'll still be on turn five because they haven't had their chance to have turn six yet. So it's at this point that you go through a few steps um, to kind of reset the game. So, for example, we're going to set some stuff up here. The Blackhawks may have been privileged at the beginning of the game to have 13 players. So in that case, they can only have 11 players on the pitch. So there would actually be two goblins in reserves. This is just a kind of example. It doesn't line up with what we had in the last episode, but they would have two players in reserve. Um, now, you can only have 11 players on the pitch. 
it's worth new coaches just double checking how many players each team's got just before they start the game because in the new rules they do say that anything anything that is on the pitch after the um i think it's the kickoff event is at some point during the game at the very beginning i think it's when after the setup maybe or after the kickoff event any player that's on the pitch at the beginning of term one gets sent off so if by accident you know the black hawks had 12 players on the pitch then the uh, opposing coach might be would notice and when they do notice they'll be able to send off a player of their choice into the sin bin um, kind of either place them in this injury box or you can place them off the pitch entirely whatever's easiest for you so the Blackhawks have just scored they've got two guys in reserve at some point during the drive a player got knocked out and we'll explain what knocked out means when we get to blocking but they also had a goblin injured during the during the game or during those first six turns. So that that little goblin is 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 out for the game. This guy in the knockout box does have a chance does have a chance to come back. So in this situation, the black hawk coach will grab his dice and for knockouts you always need a four plus to bring them back. So in this situation, he does come back and moves into the reserve box. The Elven Union team will do exactly the same thing. They may have a few more injuries. They may have actually come away unscathed. But now the Blackhawk team, they had 11 players. Two of them are off the pitch at the end of the drive. So they were down to nine. So they've only got nine players left on the pitch for the drive. So you have to bring it back to 11. So in this case, what we're going to do, we're going to obviously put our Blackhawk back on the pitch and one of the Goblins... This goblin can't return because he is injured or maybe dead. And we'll find out about that at some point. And this goblin stays in reserve. So the team has effectively gone from having 13 eligible players to 12. And then the Elven, well, the Elven Union team will do exactly the same thing on their side. And then the defense will switch. So the Blackhawk team will become the defense for the rest of this half. So they all set up first, as detailed in the last video, and the elves will set up last. And then the Blackhawks will kick to the elves. And then they will start their turn six, once the ball's landed and the game starts again, and you roll through that whole kickoff process again. And then we're going to just sort of assume that maybe the Blackhawk team hold the elves from scoring. So they get to turn eight. They've got no more turns this half. The Elven Union team also gets to turn eight and haven't scored. So it's still 1-0 to the Orcs. And at this point, that's when you refresh everything to a point. So injured players still stay here. Uh, if there's any more knockouts that have happened, you bring them back for the second half on a four plus. And in this case, there's been no more. The team stays as it was. You bring this little turn marker back to the top. You also refresh your purchased rerolls. So our rerolls go back to three. And our score counter stays on one and we effectively start again but flipped so if you remember at the beginning of this the Blackhawks received the ball so they went first in this case we'll actually be kicking the ball to the elves again even though we just kicked it to them for their turn six if that makes sense so the elves have actually had two drives back to back so you can start to think about how to match manage the game and elves being so quick agile they're very good at scoring quickly so in some regards maybe if you're the Blackhawk team you want to think about scoring later on in the in the half to give the other team as little time as possible to, to come back with a reply because remember if you do get to turn eight and you haven't scored then you're not going to score this drive and then the half is over so you're going to want to score later on in the drive with bashy teams and things like that Right, so we've looked at the dugout and how you can kind of, you have to manage the dugout during the game. But now how do you manage the players during your turns? Now we're going to look into a, well, a lot more detail into all of this in coming episodes, but I want to do a quick overview because it's like a general principle of how it all kind of goes together. So the first thing to consider is declaring your actions. Um, so every player on the pitch gets to do something in their turn. So for every turn, all 11 of your players, if you're so lucky to still have them all on the pitch, 
get to do something. They get to make an action. Now, there are two sort of three actions that everybody can do. And then there are a few actions that are one offs. So only one of your players can do these per turn. And it's worth remembering that if you've got a positional that is a blitzer, that does not mean that they are the only player that can blitz. Um, you can still pick a lineman to do a blitz if you so need to. Of course, a blitz is going to be doing a better job at it. And the same thing with a thrower. You don't need to be a thrower to pass the ball. Anybody can pass it. A few kind of new little details on that that need to be tweaked. And we'll talk about that in the passing episode. But generally, everybody can do everything. Um, the only one that's a little bit obscure is the throw teammate, which only big guys can do as long as they have that skill. So the first thing to think about is declaring an action. So uh, when you're using a player, you need to declare what they're doing. Now, you need to be very precise on what they're doing. You can't move a player, pick up a ball and then decide to pass. You sort of need to say that I'm going to try and pass the ball here. Um, so and that will be your action, your one turn action used. You'll also declare, for example, a block or a blitz. But if you declare it and you don't use it, it now counts as being used, really. So if you decide to go for a blitz, for example, um, which is where you move and hit someone, uh, which is a one turn action and you decide not to do the hit, so you decide to just move, then you can no longer blitz with anybody else, if that makes sense. So you can't call a bluff. You can't um, kind of like try and wriggle your way out of what you previously said. Um, so I'll quickly run through what these actions are. What I'm going to do, I'm actually going to show it on this or part of the pitch anyway, so you can kind of get an idea of how it all kind of looks really. So... Have we got a small segment of the pitch here just to make it a little bit easier? So every player who's on the pitch, so we're just going to get a few here. Gets to be activated. So we're just going to show three positionals for now. So it might be that this little goblin, he wants to move. So we can move him around wherever we like and we'll go into moving in the next episode. You may also want to do a block. So we'll put a little elf there as an example so this black orc might fancy having a go at this guy and we'll detail you know what you can do with this and how you do this in a later date but you'll notice i'm turning players around and it's a good way to keep a track because having 11 positionals and trying to remember who's been who hasn't been for 16 turns can be a little bit difficult so whoever you want to face them sideways backwards whatever it is you want to do to keep a track you do that there's also a few other things. So they're the kind of main actions that everybody can do. This guy could now go and move, for example. So everybody can move, everybody can block if they're eligible to. Um, and then there's a few other actions that are one-offs. So for example, get rid of elf. We might well put these all back. You might have a goblin here that's in possession of the ball. He can run up and pass the ball to this gentleman over here. And then he'll actually be finished. And it's worth from knowing that a lot of these one turn actions finish your move. So you can obviously move with the ball. You can move, pick up the ball and pass it. But we'll get into that later. You can also do a thing called a handoff where, you know, one player here who's got the ball again can go and do a simple action. So it means he doesn't have to roll for a pass. As long as he's adjacent to a friend, he can just try and get his friend to catch it. And we'll go into that again in future episodes that's a handoff you've also got throw teammate which is sort of a special skill for big guys which we'll go through where you can effectively pick up little guys and lob them um the blitz is effectively a skill where for example a player can move and hit someone at the same time and that's also a one-off kind of hit um so you can't do that more than once, but you can then continue to move if you still feel free to. So blitzing is a bit of a kind of, it's different to the others. It, it allows you to then continue moving if you want to, as long as you've got movement allowance to do so. And then there is fouling, uh, which is where a player can run up and jump on someone who's down. And then a few other special actions that I won't, we won't go into all of them, but there's a varying amount of them. So that's actions in general. 
So actions kind of, well, they, uh, they're they what your players can do. And we're going to go into real big detail on what all of those actions are um, in the next few episodes. So I hope that helps kind of summarise what you can do. However, while we've got the models here, it's worth talking about maybe the, one of the most important parts of the game, which is the turnover. I've kind of got the detail here a little bit. But I'm not going to go into every single kind of different way this can happen, but... The perfect turnover is, you know, when you've activated all 11 of your players uh, and you go, right, all of my 11 players are finished, it's your turn. But more often than not, when things go wrong in Blood Bowl, uh, your turn will end abruptly and then suddenly your, the opposition will get to go next. So there are a lot of situations in Blood Bowl where the dice will absolutely shaft you. And there'll be some situations where you're kind of just trying to do something a bit wild and it goes wrong and it's no big deal. So a couple of examples of what turnover would be could be something like this. Uh, like we just said, a handoff. This little goblin wants to hand off to this guy. He needs to roll a agility test to, to do it. Let's say, for example, he fails it. The ball will then bounce off of him. And when the ball hits the ground, I'm just going to say that eight is there. When the ball bounces off of him or he fails to catch it, then it's a turnover. So if the ball hits the ground, I'm afraid to say your turn has ended, no matter what else you might have wanted to do. You know, you might have wanted to do a little punch over here and fail it. You might have wanted to move this guy off to score. You don't, you know, could could have been a lot of things you might have wanted to do, but unfortunately your turn ends, and then the elf team then get to capitalize and start to try and get to this ball. There are a few others that are detailed because they're the most regular way for things to kind of go wrong. It might be like a block, for example. So this black orc might be trying to block. He'll roll it and then we'll show a bad result. And you might have a team re-roll that you might want to use here. Um, but in this situation, we're going to say we haven't got one. And this is a bad result when you're blocking and your guy will hit the deck and then your turn is over. So you won't be able to do any of your handoffs or passes. And in this situation, it could be quite bad because this guy can now try and do something to your ball carrier and then you're in serious trouble. So that's the turnover. There's lots of different ways it can happen. Um, and you, it will, you will, it will come up and get you at some point. They will, you will have them. But really the general principle is if anybody hits the, the, the ground that shouldn't, it's a turnover. Or, well, sorry, if anybody hits the ground on your team that shouldn't, it's a turnover. If anybody drops the ball, fumbles a pass, um, doesn't get the ball to the right place, then it's also a turnover. And also if you f you're fouling someone more often than not, you can get caught by the ref and that will also cause a turnover. And there's a few other little individual little ones that can come up, but um, it's worth checking through this page of what they are a lot of them won't come off often come up often but when they do i'm afraid your turn's over and your opponent gets to go i hope that helped that's the kind of general principles of the game so going forward we're now going to have a look in detail at the movement phase or the movement actions bye